Hello there and welcome. My name is Stephen Ball and I'm going to be taking you through today as we look at building our first native mobile applications for iOS and Android from the same source code base, fully compiled native applications for um, mobile with Rad Studio. I say my name is Stephen Ball. If you're watching this on demand, then please feel free to drop me an email. Uh, if you're watching it live, then go ahead, use the um, the chat panel that's available to you right now. Um, or you can follow up with me afterwards. I'm quite happy either way. Um, we will have a live Q&A at the end of the session uh, if you're watching this live. Um, so feel free to kind of post the questions in as we're going through. So today's session, we're going to try and get a good overview of a number of different topic areas just to help you um, take those first steps toward building your mobile applications. And um, we'll signpost you to some excellent resources to help along the way. And obviously then the next hour is gonna be a, a great foundation to get you moving forward. So in terms of foundation steps, we're gonna start off with a Hello World application. Um, look at some of the basic configuration of the machine that I'm working on here, um, just to kind of get you a, a feel for how to get going. And then, We'll start introducing a few of the kind of common components that people use and how the properties of those work across different platforms, the kind of differences that happen between mobile platforms for getting the right user experience um, and how Rad Studio handles those out of the box um, for you. Um, but it's still being good to be aware of them to help in terms of the design that you're doing uh, and also as you put the screens together to be aware of how to kind of get that user experience. Following on from that, we'll start looking into uh, frames. Frames are a very, very useful way to be able to build up functionality within your UI and your application very quickly. Uh, and I love them for the fact that it that can be so reusable and provide very bespoke kind of experiences. And certainly I've found that I'm working more and more with frames because of the way the cross-platform libraries work within Rad Studio. Um, they make it very, very easy to use them. Um, and it provides a great way to kind of separate some of that uh, logic and functionality into smaller chunks to make it easier to test and to work through. We'll then be uh, looking at data on mobile. This has been a hot topic in terms of the questions that have been coming through uh, ahead of a webinar. Uh, I've probably had more questions come through before this webinar, um, specifically asking around data than uh, I normally get on uh, pre-questions on most webinars. So we'll spend a few minutes having a look at some of the different areas there. Um, everything from requesting data to serving data out to mobile devices. And we'll also have a couple of minutes just to talk about some of the legislative issues and challenges that you need to be aware of when building mobile applications. Um, following on from that, we'll have a look at app deployment. Um, so when we've got files and data and images and sounds and things that we want to deploy out into the applications, how we go around doing that, and then also how we then take those applications that we've been building to package them together and push them out onto the App Store. Now, as we go through some of the steps today, we'll be building brand new applications, and we'll also be having a look at an application that I've written that, that is published on the, the App Store, has been there for, you know, over a year now uh, and is really really popular within the the basketball community which I'm basketball referee so um, I'll explain a bit more about that as we go through um, but we'll see real world examples of applications working um, and how to kind of get those pushed out and how a lot of it is all within Rad Studio um, directly for you to access. At the end we'll have a look at some of the next steps and um, we've got some great resources to link you to um, uh, and also kind of some uh, places to go learn some more um, because as I say it's impossible to deep dive into every single topic that we're going to cover today in the hour um, but we'll do our best to get through as much as we can. So let's start off with my platform. So my platform here I have a Mac, I'm running on a Mac. I have a Windows 10 virtual machine uh, I use VMware, uh, you can use VMware or Parallels um, for virtual machines. And the reason I'm running on a Mac um, is it means I've got a single computer to work with. Um, and to run applications out onto the Mac and onto the iPad and the I, uh, well, onto iOS, um, you need to have Apple hardware somewhere. Um, so there are some services with it in the cloud, they're quite slow to work with. 
Um, I like everything local, um, so hence I'm using my local machine to be able to deploy um, out to my Mac and then onto the device. And the way Rad Studio does that is there's a little program here we can see sat out called PA Server, uh, Platform Assistant um, PA. And uh, PA Server just opens up and runs. Um, your IDE, you just point the IP address to your Mac um, and it connects up to your PA Server with the password that you've set up on it. Um, and then that enables the devices that are plugged into the Mac uh, or the Mac itself to be a, a target that you can run and debug from directly in the IDE. Um, and that then allows all the legalities around the code signing of the apps on the Apple hardware, which is Apple's rules, um, to be done and to get the app straight out to the device. Um, for Android, it's a bit simpler. Um, Android's the biggest part of the marketplace. Um, you just need a Windows 10 machine. Um, I have a USB cable plugged into my phone that connects directly into the VM um, and then using the Android debugging, um, the ADB, uh, we're able to then connect up the phone directly into the IDE. Um, I'm just going to show you a quick setup um, configuration. Um, don't worry about uh, catching all of this. There's a couple of videos linked to on the screen here. Maybe you want to take a quick screenshot or I'll put the posts uh, the links in the, the chat as we go through uh, on the, the replay. Um, but these uh, are great videos in terms of the setup and configuration uh, and what you need to do to get your whole machine environment set up and ready to go. Um, for Apple, you will need to be part of the Apple Developer Program to run out onto the physical devices. Um, that's just you know, Apple's rules. Um, for Android, you can just set your phone to developer mode and, and off you go without having to sign up for anything. Okay, so let's jump quickly into the IDE. Under tools, uh, under here, manage platforms. If you're setting up your IDE, when you install, you'll see the screen come up as part of the installer. If you miss it, then you can just come in here. Um, I've already installed the Android and the iOS platforms. Um, the other thing for Android, uh, make sure you install the SDK um, and the OpenJDK, unless you've got the um, a JDK installed already. Um, we distribute the OpenJDK just from a licensing point of view. Uh, it's, it's simpler, um, but you need the NDK and the JDKs um, uh, and the SDK here set up, ready to be able to work with Android. So if you do ever have any problems whilst you're trying to set up, um, under Tools Options, um, you can go to the Deployment Options and we can check the SDK, the NDK and the JDK pathings. Um, so I'm just opening that up now. So here under deployment, SDK manager, you can see we've got the Android um, distribution uh, platform set up. Uh, and then here we just got all the path things. So if there's any of these, we've got a little warning sign next to them, then that's something to go and have a look at and just check the path thing to make sure that you're pointing to the file that it's, it's requiring. Um, and then that will then be able to get you ready to go. Okay, so that's a very quick look at the, the setup and configuration. Um, the other thing I would say is if you are deploying out onto the Mac, you will need to find PA server. Um, so the PA server is installed in the, uh, well, the installer for it, should I say, is available in the application installation directory. So let's just go ahead here and go to see uh, program files x86. There we are. Um, so I've got my Embarcadero Studio and the version and then the PA server folder. And here you'll be able to find the package for installation on Mac. And um, there's also the Windows version and the Linux version if you're deploying out into those um, machines and, and remotely pushing files uh, or um, running the application and debugging remotely as well. Uh, PA server is a very cool tool, um, but the installation you need for the Mac is just there. So say so just go install that on the Mac, next, 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 finish. Um, and then just from the command line, um, you just need to go and launch PA server. Um, so let me have a quick look. I think I might already have it running, which I do. So let me just close that over here. And let's just type in PA server. And you can see it opens up, asks for the password. Okay, we're good. I can leave that there for a little bit later on. So let's build our first app. So I'm going to go ahead and go file new. 
multi-device application. And here there's a number of different uh, presets that you can use to get going with. As a master detail one, as a blank application, as a header footer. Um, I'm going to use just a, a blank one because I want to show you some of the bits around as we go through. Um, if you want to really speed up your application development as well, there's the FireMonkey low code wizard, um, which is available as well. Um, and I'll show you details of how to get that added to your IDE. Um, that's an option in Get It um, that's recently been launched. So let's just go ahead and create a blank application here. So to start our application, um, I'm going to add in firstly a, a toolbar because uh, I want to have a nice little label at the top here. So pop that one in. Uh, I'm going to put a label into the toolbar. And I'm going to align the label to the contents. So under FireMark, we have a whole load of different types of alignment, um, center, client, um, contents will fix it to the full width and um, regardless of other controls that are added into it. And I'm going to go and change the uh, text settings here. Um, we can change the alignment. I'm going to set this to center. And we're just going to say hello world app. And uh, let's go ahead now and I'm going to change the style lookup. Now there's lots of different style lookups here available for a label. I'm going to put this as a tool label. And what we'll see is as we look through different platforms here, we can see it's kind of slightly changing its look and feel. And in fact, if we add a normal label onto the form here, just in comparison, we can see specifically that there is slight difference between the platforms. You know, for iOS, it's a lot bolder. Um, Windows, it looks pretty similar. Okay. So let's go ahead and add uh, an edit control in. And we're going to put in uh, a button as well. Now, I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to align these all to the top. Uh, with the toolbar, uh, I'm going to make sure this always stays at the top. I can set this to most top. Uh, They'll maintain the order that we've got them there, um, but to, just to, to show you different options, really. So let's go ahead now, and I'm going to change the spacing around these slightly. So there's two different options here. Let's try and put a little bit onto the margins. You can see that that's changing what's outside the control. So the space it reacts to the things outside it. Um, if you've got a control that is owning controls or they're parented into it um, then there's the padding and the padding can then help set the buffer inside of it so if you had a, a, a layout and that layout had lots of controls being put into it and you always wanted to have a small buffer around the edge then you could go ahead and set that in here so the um, the button here um, we're going to go ahead and change the text property here to say uh, click me. Now, quite often you might have a label to say, you know, enter a value and then the control underneath it. Um, we well, can do that. I'm actually going to get rid of that. Um, I'm going to keep hold of the, the control and um, I'm going to actually use the text prompt. And what that does, it kind of... Um, puts onto the control uh, a, a call to go and do something. So this is really good if you've got kind of a, an address to add in and you want different fields for each one. You can put you know, address one, address two, city, state, stip, um, postcode, whatever you want to call it, uh, as a text prompt. And that gives the usability, but it also condenses the screen space, which is really important for mobile. Um, the other thing that you can do with the edit controls here, um, we've got this set to the default keyboard. Um, but there's a number of different keyboards that you can use. So if you had an email um, field that you're editing in, then you could put an email address in there. If it's a numeric field, um, then you could change this to a number pad or a number pad with punctuation uh, or a phone pad. You know, so quite a few different types of uh, 
keyboards that can be uh, used um, and all you need to do is just set the property for it. So here we're just going to leave it as a default keyboard and we're literally just going to do a show message here. And just to uh, edit one to text. So um, as you'll see here on the form, and um, this is very similar to those who've used the VCL before, and um, we've got the tool palette to add the controls in. Um, each control has got the properties and the events. So we can see here we double clicked on the button. We've got the on uh, on click event. Um, there's a number of different uh, events that you can use and um, one of the great things is all the gesture control is integrated here so you could add a gesture manager down to add even more gestures on for swiping left and right and, and all that kind of stuff which is great um, and what we can do now we've got our app written is literally just to run it locally here on windows just to test it hello world to hello uh, i'm just going to put steven Hello world to Stephen, that's all working great. So let's go ahead and run this out onto mobile. And I'm gonna just pick up under the Android here. I've got my mobile phone connected. So I'm gonna go ahead and launch that. Now, whilst that's uh, doing that, I'm gonna come over here to my Mac and just open up, what is my app called? Reflector. Okay, so there we are. There's the app just launching. So here we are. Here's my um, my app running. And I'm going to tap on the screen here and write in hello world. And we've got the hello world come up, which is quite cool. Now we can see here we've got um, the Android look and feel. In fact, if I jump back, what I might want to do is just make this uh, button a little bit bigger. And I can make the control just a little bit bigger as well. Um, the other thing I can do here is I can preview how it's going to look on different devices by using the, uh, the views here. So I can view here how it's going to look on an Android 4-inch phone uh, and also on an iOS phone. OK, I'm just going to remove those views. And um, the other thing you can do with the views is you can actually modify them, uh, changing properties and, and bits around uh, to help with the alignment and anything quirky that you want to do for a specific platform. Um, I'm going to just go ahead and run this uh, same application out to my iOS device that is connected in. And I'm going to set up my screen mirroring onto my Mac as well. So you can see that's now just deploying. Now I'm running this with a debug build, um, so it's adding all the additional debugging information in and across. Um, so the first launch is always a little bit longer than anything else. Um, but then we go, we can see project two, and up it comes. And we can see now this is the same app, same code. Um, and just clicking away now on uh, my Mac, uh, so my tablet. So yeah, pretty good. All, all running quite nicely. We can see the differences in the message box. These are all kind of the native. I'll try to click on it. Use my fingers might help. Um, so good. We can see our very first Hello World app. And, and all, already we're seeing, without having to do anything in the, uh, in the code, we're getting kind of the platform variances as we should do. Okay, so first app done. Um, I just want to explain a little bit about how some of that stuff works. Um, so what makes you know, Delphi very different is we've seen the components. Now, the components basically are wrappers around lower level APIs. 
um, within different platforms, um, some really clever stuff is happening underneath with um, interfaces and the likes where it's able to map out different controls and uh, different functionality to provide kind of native implementations where possible. Um, or it uses kind of style versions um, uh, to kind of get the stuff through. Um, one property I didn't actually point out quickly here on the control is there is, um, where is it? Control type property here. Now at the moment this is set styled, um, which means it's gonna use the, the theming. Um, we can set this to platform. Uh, and that will then render a platform specific version. Now that's great for most instances and you'll see in the IDE you get a little um, icon appear to show that this is going to be the, the native control. That can add additional functionality around um, you know, text to speech and, and stuff like that. Um, but it does draw back some of the additional styling that you can do and user functionality bits that you can add in. Um, but uh, either is you know, will look exactly the same if you're not using kind of a, a completely different style within your application other than the default platform style. So let's jump back to here. I say the the way this works is, is really, really clever, um, giving great flexibility and functionality, especially if you start looking into things like the accelerometers and the cameras and uh, a number of other things. Um, but that's basically what's providing a single code base. Now, um, I'm just going to quickly point out that there's a whole load of additional samples. So under the welcome page, uh, if you go ahead and open a sample project, you can start digging into the UI controls um, and all the different functionality around, you know, kind of the language and, and bits like that. Um, just jump into the object Pascal. There's a whole load of multi-device snippets and mobile specific snippets, um, which these tend to be more about the UI. Um, the mobile snippets tend to be more about some of the mobile specific things like you know, using uh, intents on Android or using the camera components or um, using the different date time pickers, storing data into a database, um, using the locations, the geosensors and the phone dialer service, the share sheet service, which is great for kind of sharing things directly from the application. Um, video playback, web browsing, and so on. So definitely worth having a dig into the samples. Um, there's some really, really cool um, stuff within there. I mentioned at the top, there's the new low code wizard. Um, if you don't see that, then open up the, oh, back. open up uh, tools, get it package manager. Um, Within the Get It Package Manager, you just need to install the FireMonkey Low Code Wizard. And once that's installed, you'll then see the additional menu option for the FireMonkey Low Code um, Wizard within the multi device section when you go File, New, Other, um, Project Type. Uh, and then that pops up these three windows. You literally just put in a project name, choose the account setup, the um, application routines that you want to have, uh, and any additional kind of elements around contacts and empty form and so on. Um, and then hit finish and that will then produce you the application um, with all the kind of frames and all the other kind of bits that have built in. So I want to jump on straight into the next bit, have a look at using kind of the tab controls, having a look at the master detail layout and um, text prompts and the keyboard and, and so on. So um, we kind of touched on the text prompts already, but let's have a quick look at a few of the other things. Okay, so I've um, jumped back into the IDE here and literally just gone file new multi-device application and pick the master detail template because I wanted to show you one that's kind of just got a few more bits popped onto it now and um, save time having to do that uh, all live. Uh, one of the controls that we have down here is a non-visual control and this is the prototype bind source. And um, this is quite good. Uh, there's an on create adapter event which allows you to link and bind in kind of uh, real live objects into it uh, and map those objects to the fields that are on here. Um, we've got just some default names for fields that have been generated using the default generators that are within here. 
Uh, and that's just giving us some sample data to see how a UI is going to look at design time um, as we're prototyping uh, an application. Um, the other thing that we've got on here, uh, we've got uh, an action list. And the action list has got in here two events, live binding events for moving to the next and the prior record. Um, and these are linked to the prototype bind source to help you navigate through. And uh, we've got a button. This is just a normal speed button here that has been um, set to have a style lookup. So style lookup is a detailed tool button. Uh, and now it's looking like a hamburger button here. If we go and have a look through different platforms, we can see how these buttons are going to style and look differently yeah, in different places accordingly to the, the platform. In terms of the data from the prototype bind source, um, the one thing about the FireMonkey applications is that data is bound using live bindings. Um, so any control can be data aware. Any property on control can be data aware. Now, the prototype bind source has got this sync connected to keep the bind source and the controls in sync, as you would do with a normal data set, really. Um, and then it's just got the bitmaps linked to different fields um, and to the uh, and also into kind of the uh, the list view um, that's here. So let's go ahead and have a quick look at this on Windows. We can see we've got this little pop out running here. Now this is a, a multi view, which allows us to navigate through and we can see it's we're clicking through. It's just popping down and we can navigate back and forth between different people, um, which is pretty good. That's a master detail data. Uh, the multi view is a really nice control. Um, the way it works, uh, we can see here we've got a layout and we have got our button as well, which is uh, linked there. The, the multi view has a master button um, for controlling the pop out and a target control, which is the layout. And then the multi view knows to respond to those um, in terms of pushing them or over, you know, going over the top of them. And, and then within the multi view, we've got a, basically a container area, which we've put the list view into for putting all the, the details. Uh, and the list view is set up to have an item appearance that shows the image on it. So we can see here, this is an image list item. And that's then showing the different fields within the list view here that we're then able to bind to. And you can customize this and put whatever you want onto it. It's a very flexible control, but great for loading you know, big lists of data into. So let's go ahead and run this out onto my Android device. Uh, I'm just gonna switch this over to release mode. So it's a little bit quicker to run through because we're not going to be doing any live debugging. So let's uh, see if I can just get my screen back over here. Okay, that's just installing now, so we should see that launch up in just a second now. And here it comes. So we can see here the same application. I can navigate through the different people. We can see the images changing, the text changing. And if I click the detail button, we can see the list pop out. Now let's use uh, James. And uh, if I rotate my screen around, Yeah, all kind of lining up and, and looking pretty good. Now on a tablet, um, if I was to run this out on landscape on a tablet, then the, the multi view would actually kind of appear on the left hand side um, perpetually because it understands the screen sizing and that it, there's space enough for it to exist there, um, which is pretty cool as well. And then as we switch it around through to portrait, it would just kind of disappear. Um, good.
Okay, so we've had a quick look now at the tabs. We've seen the prototype bind source. We've seen the master detail. Um, we've had a look at text prompts, uh, mentioned about the keyboard types, and uh, being able to choose those from the edit control. And uh, now let's get in and have a look at using frames. So frames are a great way to break up your application and to provide functionality in multiple different places and uh, and kind of uh, you know, build a UI kind of dynamically as you move through the application. Now, with, the, with this app here, we can see multiple tabs and the game tab has got a master detail view within it, which is being controlled by a single frame. And then the directory has got a separate frame Again, with frames inside it, with the telephone numbers and the email functionality being provided by, again, different frames um, as they're required. So let's have a quick look at how that works and how we're able to kind of load that on demand um, and speed up the application. Because when you're pulling data in, especially if you're pulling remote data, you don't want to kind of be pulling it if you're not going to be looking at it. Now, even with local data, um, having that data loaded on demand is a much more efficient use of the device's CPU, memory, uh, and all that kind of side of things. So great practice to be able to kind of lazy load the stuff as you need. So here we've got a set of data that is being fetched from a local database. We've got uh, a, a game between here, this is the University of Herefordshire uh, versus Brighton, and we've got a tip time and a date, and we've got a division, um, that it's running in and we can see the master list kind of the high level view of what we want to click onto. Now this is a dynamic layout on a list view which then when you select one it's then going through to the detail tab. So again this is you can see here we've got a tab running um, and the detail again this is a number of frames um, that I've got a layout for and then a list view underneath with additional information about who is part of the, the crew for that game. So let's have a quick look at that in code. So here's my, my form. And um, we can see here, I've got my, my game tab. And if we go in to actually have a look at the frame, uh, where's the game frame? So the style is applied as it's parented into the main form. Um, so we don't have any styling in here, which is quite, you yeah, know, it's fine. It's quite useful. Um, we can see here now we've got the two tabs for the match and the match details. Again, these tabs are hidden at runtime. So one of the things that I often do within my forms is actually override the constructor and put a form create in. So here we do a constructor create, um, passing in the A owner and just do inherited create on that. Um, here I've got a special option for a premium edition, which is part of the in-app purchase within the application, which then just helps set up the, the details of what's going on with the frame as it creates. So um, within the form hit, oh, sorry, the frame, uh, the list view, again, this is dynamically created. And we can see here the item, I've added in a number of different uh, uh, items on here so you can add a new one in here dynamically and set the type that it's going to be if it's an image or a text or a checkbox or so on um, and then name it uh, and by naming those I then make it easier to kind of uh, link the bits together. This is all being fed from a, a query that's run so here's my base query um, and uh, I then use the field editor to add all the fields in and I've also got some calculated fields. For example, um, the status color is a string field that's calculated at runtime. Again, that provides specific detail for the record. Some parts used on the list view, some used in the detail. And for example, here, uh, if we go ahead and bind uh, visually, uh, if we have a look at the, the status here, we can see here we've got the text being picked up, but also the font color is being picked up um, and set at runtime. And again, just go in here and use the, uh, the checkbox to pick up the additional values that you want to show in the binding. So you can then link to those. Uh, this is a frame. 
something here's here. This is a, a data frame, and the data frame then provides specific functionality, um, which uh, provides yeah, the, the basic layout. And then we've got a frame with an action as well. So the frame with the action then provides the ability to do the, the call button. Um, and that picks up based on the data, um, what type of action is gonna be available, uh, and then the method for calling that back. So again, this is inheriting from that base layout, adding additional functionality in. Um, if you're creating frames or you wanna add frames into your project, um, File new other, and uh, if you just type in here frame, you can create a blank frame, uh, or you can create a base frame which you then inherit from, uh, or you can see I've then had uh, the data frame which I've then uh, you know had inheritance from for doing the uh, the additional frame with additional functionality, uh, and they're a great way to break the bits through. Uh, in terms of loading in at runtime. Um, one trick that you can do is use the on change event. And then in the on change event, you can literally just say, okay, I've changed this tab. Um, I'm using a check to see if the tab contains a specific class. And if not, then I just load an instance of that class in. And that just saves me having lots of different pointers that I'm referencing to and checking to see if it's assigned or not. I can just literally clear the contents of the tab the frame will be freed because of the way parenting works and ownership. And then I can just go load a new one in later on if I need to. So really nice and clear and easy way to see if, if that's existing or not. Um, now this contains is part of a class helper. So um, let me just show you the, the code for that. So here I've got a class helper for a T-tab item uh, and that has the contain option on there, which just then finds the class and then says, yep, yeah, I've got it or not. Uh, and then I can, find an array of all the types of object that match a class in a frame. So useful if I'm using different types of frames and then I can just free those out of the way if I want to kind of get them rid of them. Um, and then here, this is the refreshing assigner data. This is just passing in a date time and basically through the application, I have a date time for when it's loaded up and refreshed. If it's passed in a newer date time to refresh, then it goes, oh, I need to refresh my setup and the frame does that and manages by itself. Um, which is quite a nice easy way to do that and then we've got a little method here just to to say hey go do something um so that's great that's my frames uh, and how i've been using them brilliant way to get working with stuff so let's go ahead now and look at displaying data and um, fetching data and storing data and we've already kind of touched on it slightly um so i won't kind of go too much over those and uh, we've seen the live bindings and um, with the data uh, database we can just drag and drop between the controls we've seen the live bindings on the the ui again just drag between the control and the uh, the, the binding and, and off you go uh, if you want to really get into live bindings then have a look at the videos that i've done on my blog um, there's a number of them uh, going through all the basics from you know simple bindings to bind, you know, defining the bindings at runtime um, to doing uh, kind of advanced master detail data, uh, data sets. Um, so a, a great way to kind of get through. We've also seen the master um, view, uh, the multi view, um, which is quite a, a cool way to kind of get things through. And there's a few questions about grids. Um, I'm not gonna show grids today. Um, there are grids, you can put a grid down, you can bind to a grid. Um, TMS do some really advanced grids as well for FireMonkey, um, as do wall-to-wall -wall software. Um, there's a number of different you know, component vendors that do really cool grids for use on mobile. Um, I've kind of preferred to use frames uh, and to put stuff out um, just because it gives me a different kind of uh, way to lay stuff out um, that's not necessarily bound to being a, a grid type view, which I don't think always works specifically on a smaller mo you know, mobile device. And I think having the master detail relationships and using kind of uh, list views with dynamic control generation uh, is potentially a, a different way to look at it uh, and more useful. But again, the options are there and available. Whatever works for the screen space and that you're working on is a way to go. So we've kind of covered the kind of the displaying data now. I want to kind of move on to kind of the fetching and serving of data out to a remote device. Now, when it comes to pushing data out onto mobile, 
Um, I think the one thing that you need to be kind of aware of with mobile devices compared to desktop devices is that mobile devices are moving around a lot. So the connection to a remote server, a database server, is not the same. It's not as stable um, because you're moving from cell mask to cell mask or from you know, hotspot to hotspot um, within the Wi-Fi network and so on. So the connection can be up and down quite a bit. So rest is really the order of the day. And you can work with RAD server um, to serve out data and to get that into the client. You can work with Datasnap, again, which provides you know, a great functionality. Uh, if you're using Datasnap, then you need to make sure that you've got the Midas options set up in the app deployment. And we'll cover that a little bit later on. Um, the other thing is, obviously, if data reliability is key, you need to think about offline data and caching data into your applications. Now, a great way to do that is using Interbase. Now, the Enterprise and Architect editions of Rad Studio, um, Delphi and C++ Builder, include a runtime royalty-free distribution license of Interbase to Go. Now, Interbase to Go contains the award-winning Change Views feature, which allows you just to basically set up a subscription against your database tables, and then uh, when you connect in and you need to push data back, just to start the subscription, run the query and get exactly what's changed at a field level in the table. And you can then push those changes back, um, which is phenomenal. Um, you can also use change views on a remote server to be able to pick up customized changes of centralized data to distribute back out to the remote device, um, which means you can reduce the payloads that you're pushing around. Speed and performance of data transfer is huge then. It saves on data costs. Um, and you know, it really helps you scale to tens of thousands of remote devices in a way you just can't do with any other you know, central data store. Uh, Interbase to Go also um, is really secure, um, provides on disk encryption, um, which again, if you're using and storing any personalized data, is absolutely essential from a legislation point of view, um, as we're kind of mentioning here in terms of the storage of data. Um, so offline data is really, really handy um, for just kind of working with um, data, especially if you're having to cache the same stuff regularly. Um, so Interbase is a great option for that. So in terms of the fetching and pushing data, um, regardless of the backend that you use, I'm not going to jump into building a RAD server instance today or a data snap instance. Um, if you, you have a look at the Delphi Labs, um, and data snap, there's some amazing videos there showing you how to get that up and running and to kind of serve the data out from any type of database. Um, one of the other things that you need to be aware of on mobile is that you, you don't have that many choices in terms of live database connections. Even if you're kind of within a warehouse scenario locally, you know, Interbase is pretty much the only one that you can run directly from the device to the central database. You know, SQL Server, Oracle, uh, MySQL, uh, they're just not the drivers to embed on the mobile devices that you need to then be able to do that live direct connection back. Hence why, again, using Datasnap and RAD server would be the, the ultimate way to go there. Now, you, one of the best things to do is obviously to use REST for data fetching uh, and to service it through. So I'm just going to do a, a quick example of how to kind of do that. Um, we've uh, one of the other companies within the IDERA group uh, is a company called API Layer. Uh, and one of the API Layer APIs is this uh, weather stack. Um, so I've literally just signed up. And let's just take this out full screen here. Signed up on there, got myself uh, an API key. Um, it takes seconds to do that. Um, and then uh, in the documentation here, I can see there's a simple request um, passing my API key and running the query and go New York. So here, if I run that, I've just set this up with uh, the query for London. And we can see that there's a request, a location, and a current um, providing different information bits that I can potentially use. So a uh, great way to get that into Rad Studio is by using the REST debugger. So uh, here we've got uh, the REST debugger. And I've literally just copied, uh, to open the REST debugger, just go to Tools, uh, REST debugger, uh, and it'll open up. Um, I copied the API weatherstock stack.com uh, base URL in, 
and then under the resources I've put the current and that's because the resource we're calling is called current and then the parameters uh, access key and query Now I could add those parameters in here if I wanted to to make changes to them uh, that's you know, certainly doable uh, and when requesting it I can see here now I've got a request um, a location name and current and that kind of matches up in terms of what uh, what we see on the actual API when it runs here we see the request location and current um, and the, the location weather icons is an array and so is the weather descriptions um, so let's go ahead and just uh, pick that up uh, I'm gonna copy this set of uh, components and I'm going to do a little bit of jigging here uh, just to make this a little bit cooler so first of all um, the response here is pulling uh, data back so I'm just going to check my uh, root element here this is just pulling everything back into a single array so I'm going to go ahead and change my root element to the request and let's just make a copy of these we're going to need a couple of copies uh, there was the request uh, the other one was the location and current Let's change this one to location. And let's go ahead now and update the request. And I can go to the field editor here and I can add in all the fields. There's the first set of fields. Uh, on the second one for the location, we can see the different bits. And on the current, we can see all the details coming back here for the uh, for the current one. Now we can add an additional data set adapter for the um, uh, to go even deeper. Um, so if we jump back here, uh, let's go ahead and uh, send the request in. Now we know under the current, we want to apply that in. And then here we can get the array of the array of weather icons. So if I was to copy the components now, I'd be able to get the specific one for that, which I can then work with, and that'll give me a data set based on the original one. Um, so pretty cool stuff um, to be able to get the data back. And again, in terms of building the mobile UI, just do what you learned already. Um, call the rest request one dot execute and do that as a single button call uh, and then just bind to the controls so um, let's just bind to these um, controls here quickly uh, region uh, so bind visually region link to a new t edit control um, let's uh, humidity link that to a new edit control and uh, maybe wind speed link that to a new edit control let's just hide the controls off the screen for the moment so we can now see we're starting to get our data in um, so just set this to execute Uh, there we are. We can see the um, the data has come straight through, which is pretty cool. Humidity of 42, wind speed of 11 um, for Greater London at the moment. Okay, so on to the last quick summary, really. Um, I say pretty fast paced to try and get through a lot today. Um, when it comes to having built your application, um, then 
you're probably going to have files that you want to deploy with the application. Um, under project deployment, then you can add in files to deploy. Um, here for the uh, app that I showed you earlier, the basketball one, um, we have a shot clock which has an air horn um, that sounds when the timer runs out. Um, and I have that in my folder utilities shot clock um, from where the project is built. Um, and then there's a file for air horn 3GP, which runs on the Android and the WAV file that runs on all the other platforms. So if you select the platforms that you want, you can add the files in and then you can say you know, which platforms that file is there for. Um, but the key thing about selecting the platforms is to set the remote path. So for default, um, if you set them to assets internal, that's the kind of the documents directory for Android. And to set up documents uh, is kind of the documents directory for uh, iOS. Uh, and then you can do something like this here. So um, here I've got a multiple different you know, files that I load in um, and uh, I just pass in the base part of the name and then I apply the extension because I know the extension is going to be the same for each of the file names. So I have a method that I just, you know, if it's on Android, then I set up the file to be 3GP. And if it's on iOS, I set it to, or anything else, I set it to be WAV. And then I just check to see the file exists. And then if it does, I set the media that's passed in to have the file linked to it. Um, now, the great thing here, I'm using tpath.combine. Now this is part of system.iotils. And that then allows you to bring together this documents path along with the file with the correct delimiters, if they're forward slashes or backslashes. Um, uh, and that kind of brings obviously the base part here with the file. Now, if you want to put it somewhere else, you can change the path as you set it up here um, and that will then copy those in. Um, the other thing I mentioned earlier about um, data snap um, was uh, Midas. Um, so you need to be able to enable the feature files now here, uh, you can see the Midas ones down here that you can tick on to include. Um, I've got ticked here uh, the interbase options for interbase to go. And then what I've done is I've just gone through and updated the license that I want to use. Um, part of the redistributable folder, um, you can go and put your license there as a reg underscore ib to go dot txt. Um, if you don't have the enterprise edition and you're just using the standard interbase, um, IB Lite, which is a free version as well, um, but it doesn't have the encryption or interface um, change views, then uh, you just have the IB Lite license ticked. Uh, and that's all you need. You can just set that up and, and deploy that out. Um, and again, um, that'll then just pick that up from the redistributable folder. Um, the final part around deployment is obviously app provisioning. Again, this is all done through the IDE. Um, you can set up your uh, app developer account details. Um, if you've got them all connect correctly set up on iOS, for iOS, then a PA server will just suck those directly in from, uh, from your Apple uh, connection straight into the IDE for you. And you just need to go into the provisioning and uh, it will automatically detect it based on the application and the, um, uh, the details that you set up for the device identifier within uh, Rad Studio. Uh, and then uh, off it'll go. It will pick the rest of the bits up for you pretty quickly. Um, if you've got a, a generic wildcard one for testing, um, it can pick that up or you can override that here again. Um, so that's that's pretty cool. Uh, again, under project options, under the deployment provisioning. Um, for Android, for Android, obviously there's the key file store. Um, you can create the key file that you need in here. Um, just make sure you save those usernames, passwords down. Um, keep them somewhere safe um, because if you lose them, then you're, you know, you're stuck. Um, but that's great as a way to generate the key file store. Uh, and then once you've done that and you've signed it, um, you can uh, distribute those directly up to the, uh, the packages that get built when you choose the provisioning profile of App Store within the IDE. Um, so under here, if we go to Target, uh, you can do the configuration of App Store here. Uh, if you build and run out for the App Store, um, it, same thing for Android, then obviously it will then just produce the, uh, the distributable file that you need to then upload to the App Store, um, which you do in the normal way. So we're pretty much out of time. Um, I hope that's been a, a useful introduction for you. Um, 
there's a whole set of great resources on DocWiki um, and to, to take you through examples and the samples that I mentioned earlier in the session. Uh, LearnDelphi.org is a fantastic place to go. Um, you can get the free Object Pascal handbook if you want to learn about the language and the setup from LearnDelphi.org as well. Um, also, keep an eye on the YouTube and the Twitter accounts um, from Barcadero Tech and Barcadero TechNet. Um, they're a great place to go and uh, keep up with the new stuff that's coming through. And the blogs as well, blogs.embarcadero.com. Um, if you don't have a, a trial of Raj Studio today, um, then go to the Embarcadero website and you can just download uh, a free trial of, of Delphi um, and you know, set that up in moments to, to kind of get going uh, and, uh, and enjoy your coding. So I think that's pretty much us. Um, time for our Q&A. Uh, so if you are watching this on demand, please feel free just to email me through uh, at stephen.wall at embarcadero.com. OK, so I um, just want to run down some of the uh, the questions from the Q&A. Um, thank you. Um, there's been some really good kind of questions uh, popping through. Just to answer um, one of the ones here, um, the app that I was showing, uh, yes, I do have an app purchasing uh, integrated into it. Uh, and one of the things that I found quite useful when going through that was to set up uh, a base form. Um, the application has kind of four core areas uh, and different kind of functionality within each area, um, which means there's a kind of different side menu. Um, and for each of those different side menu areas, um, there's always the base two or three items and then additional bits added in. So uh, having the base form which then had all the kind of the callback API integrations for the in-app purchasing, then made that very, very uh, easy to work with and then just override that on the inherited version. Um, and then you kind of get the notification through when that happens, all the kind of core logic happens automatically for you. Uh, and then you just need to do the, the form specific element of it, which is quite, quite easy. Um, in terms of uh, other questions that we had here, um, the compilation for Android, um, a couple of questions, um, one around 32 and 64 bit. Um, so uh, the both the app stores now require that you submit 64 bit versions. Uh, in fact, iOS is um, only accepting now 64 bit versions through. Um, the Android, however, does um, when you build for the App Store, it actually compiles both the 32 and the 64 bit version of your application code um, and then packages those together into the same distribution package, which is then pushed up to the Android Store. Now, you can override that in the project options. You can set it to only compile the 64 bit version and submit that. Um, but if you want to support both, then you can do that. Now, the current version of Rad Studio supports um, Android 6 and above in terms of as a deployment target. Um, Android 5, um, which is still uh, around for quite a few of the older Amazon Fire devices, um, you can use 10.3.3 for compiling out onto Android 5. Um, and you can submit uh, that application up onto the um, the Amazon app store, although the market for it isn't particularly massive and the devices are not particularly powerful that you're going to be targeting with that. Um, but for everything else, um, Android 6 and above, um, you just recompile in the app store and push it out and off it goes. Um, uh, and it's pretty straightforward. Um, you log into the uh, Google Play console, um, upload your, your app package, uh, it then does a whole load of testing against different devices, gives you a report back and, and so on. So it's, it's, it's pretty good functionality um, online for the developer portal side of things, which can help in terms of just getting the spread of, of testing done. Um, for iOS, um, the, the one thing you do need is to have a reasonably modern device. Um, if you're doing direct screenshots from it, it just makes it a little bit easier. Um, and uh, obviously you need to have the Apple hardware, uh, which we mentioned at the top of the uh, the webinar, uh, which is uh, an Apple requirement. Uh, I, Jacob asked about, or Jacob asked about um, push notifications. Um, obviously, push notifications you can set up. There's some settings that you need to set up in the projects options to enable the push notifications to come through. 
uh, and you need to set the permissions as well. Um, one of the things I didn't have kind of time to go through today was showing you how to set up your own icons, um, splash screen images, and these are all just part of the project options. Um, so uh, you can just go and take the, the default ones that are there um, and that'll give you all the sizes and you can then go through and make your own images. Um, also, I'd say there's a, a number of uh, icon generators online. So if you generate a full size image of your icon, uh, you can then go search web pages and you can put the upload your master icon and it will then generate you all the different icon sizes for the different setup and configurations that are required to go in the stores. Um, and that's a great way to be able to kind of speed to getting those done. Uh, and then if you just put them as a relative path, um, you know, I actually have a folder in my subversion um, for all the images. Uh, and then the project just links back to those as a relative path um, and then just pulls those in at the point that it's being you know, packaged together. Um, uh, there's also a question here about having your application look the same on all platforms. Um, obviously, if you don't want to use the native platform look and feel, um, and you know, the example I had, I use one of the styles. Um, so I've done, I've used the style book and there's each form has a style book property, which you can choose to define which style book the form's going to use. Uh, and you can load multiple styles into the style book as well. Um, but obviously the more you put in there, the more kind of size it's adding to your application. Um, and then, yeah, you can use that and, and run that off. So it'll look the same on each platform. What I'd probably say is it's still probably worth using you know, the, the smart elements of the controls, like the tab controls with the positioning to be top or bottom, um, because that's kind of what's expected by the users on that platform. Um, they're not going to be used to looking on iOS at the top of the screen to find the tabs. They're going to be at the bottom. That's where they expect them to be. So just from that usability, if you are using a specific theme, then I'd still look at using some of those default platform specifics. Um, Leandro asked about emulators, um, specifically for Android. Um, honestly, um, the Android emulators, I don't, you know, I think we actually officially support them. Um, uh, certainly the ones that we've looked at in the past have been terrible um, because they're doing ARM emulation on Intel and they've been really, really poor. Um, uh, so I, I would definitely just kind of get an Android device. You know, uh, I've got one that I picked up off eBay um, that is relatively, you know, I think an Android 9 device for about £100 um, that was kind of a few years old. Um, you know, keep an eye around. You can you can get some decent deals um, and they're absolutely just perfect for testing on. Um, doesn't have to have masses of memory. Uh, so you can pick up the ones that people normally kind of throw away quickly because they want the ones with the bigger hard disk space, but they're absolutely fine for testing on. Um, I, I've got a, a few different devices now in my drawer. I call it my drawer of doom because it's kind of uh, the drawer. I have to kind of pull things out and plug them in all the time. Um, but uh, yeah, that, that's a, a great way to kind of test out onto some different devices. And I'd normally just say, you know, a few different sizes and a, a couple of different versions of Android. Uh, you, you don't need to test on three different devices of the same version of Android. You know, that's that's just crazy. Uh, and iOS seems to really work quite well. And if you get the alignments and the, the margins and the paddings and you kind of start thinking around that kind of way, uh, if you start using kind of uh, a layout, um, one thing I was going to show in here today, and I, I just missed out, um, there's instead of putting a, a panel down, which you would do in the VCL, you use a layout. If you put the layout down and then parent the controls into the layout, um, that's a great way to be able to kind of center a bunch of controls within a certain sizing and, and stuff like that. Um, layouts are a great way to kind of get things laid around. And if you get your layouts done well, then it'll dynamically size to the, the UI that it's running on, um, which is which is really nice. So. Um, just a quick ask here about the configuration and setup. Um, again, uh, I run on a Mac with VMware. Um, Windows 10 and then Bad Studio installed on top. Um, and then that's it. Um, uh, I've got a base Windows 10 image that I have with kind of my version control software, um, Google Chrome installed because it's better for you know, development and testing with um, than kind of Edge and just to be able to kind of see the XML and all that kind of stuff. Um, uh, and then, uh, yeah, every time I need to do a new 
setup and configuration. I just copy my base VM and then load Rad Studio into it uh, and off I go. Um, question about kind of the difference between debug and release mode. Um, yeah, obviously the, the debug mode um, produces the same executable, but with all the um, extra stuff for connecting and debugging, um, which you, know, you don't really want to deploy that into the real life world. You don't want people being able to try and connect up into your applications in the same way. So um, always deploy out using the release mode. Um, and uh, yeah, it'll just run a little bit faster. Um, question here about when to use frames and when to use forms. Um, I always find it best to use um, frames as much as I can. Uh, I tend to only use forms when I've got um, uh, kind of separate functional areas within the application. Um, so if I've got different side menus that I'm going to be running, then I might think about using a separate form uh, unless it makes sense that I've got a specific area that all needs to be running the same thing, then I might have a, a specific side menu in a frame and then parent other stuff into that frame. So, you know, that's another way to do it. Um, it's really down to you which way you want to go. Um, you know, both ways are possible. Um, it, it really doesn't make a huge, huge difference. The one nice thing about using frames and having a single form is you then haven't got forms to hide and reshow if you're kind of trying to deploy the same application out onto a desktop. Um, when you generate a new form on mobile, it just overlays over the top. So you can leave the other one hidden behind it and you don't get to see it, um, which isn't the same on uh, on Windows and Mac. So if you're trying to push the same you know, code out onto those platforms, then that might be something to have a think about. Uh, I think I mentioned the rest of those bits there. Uh, have a look at the other questions that just popped through. Um, answer that one. Uh, in terms of uh, there's a question from Demetrius about notifications for updates. Um, if you deploy out through the Google Play Store, um, then at the point that you push it to live, that will then notify that there's the update for the app there and available. Um, if you want to send push notifications from a remote server, um, there's a couple of ways to look at that. Um, if you've got a data snap um, connection, then you can get notifications pushed out through the data snap connection that there's something you know, changed that you can pull down. Um, the other thing is to use push notifications, which will then kind of send a message through. And you then set up the configuration for the, um, uh, there's kind of some manifest changes and setup that you do to then alert your application about the change. And then you code the kind of the, the receiving event basically to deal with that as it comes through. Um, so there's a question here about installing Mac OS onto a Windows machine. Yeah, unfortunately that's not possible because um, it comes down to the legal licensing to do with the Mac OS. Um, so I, I think you know, with the exception of Germany, I think everywhere else in the world, um, you need to have uh, Apple hardware that you're running the Mac OS on. I think there's been some legal thing done in Germany. I wouldn't quote me on that, um, where it means you can buy an Apple hardware and as long as you've bought the Apple hardware, you can then install the OS onto a Windows machine and use it, um, which is kind of like a, a weird thing. But um, that was certainly my understanding of what I've been told by others there. But um, uh, yeah, basically, it's down to the end user license agreement for the Mac OS. And you can't agree to that unless you're running it onto Apple hardware. Um, so limitations for C++ Builder. Um, obviously, C++ Builder, um, fine with the iOS side. Um, Android is still 32-bit only. Um, uh, so uh, the problem with that is that uh, you need to be able to provide a 64-bit version to deploy into the app stores um, for Android, um, for, for Google Play. Uh, although there's no real technical reason for it, it's just something that's been introduced uh, in the similar way that it had been for iOS. Um, 
Uh, but to, yeah, 64-bit, uh, sorry, 32-bit still can provide out to other stores and you can build 32-bit applications that you can deploy out on your own um, Android devices quite happily. So uh, there shouldn't be a, a major challenge there apart from deploying out onto the Google Play Store. Um, there's a question here about um, classroom sessions. Obviously, the, uh, the key thing uh, we mentioned about is learndelphi.org. Um, also, keep an eye out on the events on the Embarcadero events um, page because we quite often get sessions run. You know, I mean, you know, there's been quite a few in the Nordics, um, which are done in English um, primarily. Um, so, uh, you know, people like Jens Fudge is doing a, a number of great sessions. Um, there's a, yeah, but, uh, yeah, the events page on the Embarcadero website is a good place to kind of keep an eye out for some of those. Um, so in the question about publication to the App Store, um, the key thing, you just need to go through the steps. Um, uh, it's all really well documented in DocWiki. Um, you know, doc, um, DocWiki, uh, D-O-C-W-I-K-I um, dot Embarcadero.com. Um, I've put a few of the links into the, the chat, um, but yeah, that, that's a great place to kind of go to get the, um, the steps that you need to go through. Um, the, the main thing is just building the apps, getting them tested on your local device and then bundling them and then getting the, the packages uploaded um, and then going through the app store sub, you know, submission. It will take a few weeks for the first one to go through. Updates are a lot quicker, um, but uh, there is a, a good amount of quality checking um, to make sure that what's being distributed is what it says on the tin um, and is kind of a, a legal use of the app store. Um, and once you're through that, then it's pretty easy to kind of get the apps um, pushed out for the updates. Um, so uh, the question here about ad hoc, well, sending the apps on your Mac to somebody. Um, I think uh, you might be alluding here to kind of ad hoc deployments. So um, there's an option instead of uh, the app store, you can build an ad hoc deployment, um, which you can then side, you know, you can load onto a, a, an Apple device or make available for download. Um, that does the same code signing to verify it's built by you and uh, on all those kind of bits and then makes them available to push through. Uh, in terms of the in-app purchase functionality, another question here from Martin. Um, again, really well documented in DocWiki. Um, there's also been uh, sessions that have been done at Code Rage um, about that in the past. Um, so if you just search you know, in-app purchasing Delphi, um, then you'll be able to find those sessions. Um, basically, there's a component that you uh, use um, and you set up uh, in the app stores, you set up your... Um, kind of token that is going to be sent through um, for a specific purchase. Um, and you can then set up your pricing and everything online uh, in the App Store. Uh, and then you have a, a notification event in the app for, for managing the kind of the responses that come back through to make sure it's you know, been processed and paid for. Uh, and then you can deal with that. Uh, and there's kind of a few different types of um, uh, app or app in in-app purchases. There's perpetual ones. And then there's consumable ones. So if you think of a perpetual one, it might be like buying premium mode for the application, whereas something that you consume and use, which you then need to kind of manage where they are with that, might be kind of you know, 20 coins to do something in the app. And they use the coins and then they need to buy some more. So there's different types that you can set up. Uh, again, it's all really well documented in DocWiki. Um, uh, and uh, there's been some great sessions already run on those um, if you want to kind of dive into those. Um, but the great thing is you, you write it once and it works across all the platforms. The, the, the components do a really good job of um, encapsulating the functionality and providing you a really, really simple to use uh, approach for doing that, which is brilliant.
Um, so a couple of requests around source code for the project that I showed. Um, the the project that I showed, I, I can't unfortunately share the source code for that one, um, but uh, there is, uh, I, I will be doing some session, well, do some blog posts at some point around frames and how to use frames um, and a couple of examples of using them um, because they are a, a really, really useful um, thing to do. Um, and again, you know, uh, if you are really interested in frames, um, definitely search T frame stand. Um, it's in uh, get it. So under tools, get it in the project, in the IDE. Um, searching T frame stand, that's a great um, uh, component to add into your project. And uh, again, there's a great YouTube videos showing you how to use that and to work through it. Uh, in terms of managing state, um, have a look at the form events. Um, there's a, uh, you can pick up when the application's going asleep and, and stuff like that, and you can deal with what you want to deal with there. Um, if you have a look through the example code that's made through the low code app wizard, then you'll be able to see that there's um, a sample of using state um, within there as well, um, which is pretty good. Um, in terms of the supported platforms, I popped a link into the chat earlier, um, but Android 6 and above uh, is supported, so it supports Android 11. Um, and uh, yeah, that's the answer to that one. Uh, and finally, a question here, um, is it possible to do low level Android and iOS function calls? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, one of the great things about using the components is that um, you don't have to that often, um, but if you want to, you can. Um, so for example, when you access the camera component um, on iOS, you actually get an iOS camera uh, API component back. Um, and on Android, it's actually instigating, instigating the Android component. Um, so, and that's doing low level you know, API calls. Um, so yeah, you can get right the way down to the metal. Um, and one of the great things is that actually, you know, it is fully compiled code. You know, you can reach everything and anything you want to. Um, the the way that the object oriented programming is being done, though, uh, means that uh, most of the time you don't need to. You know, uh, where these different um, platform interfaces are there, um, they've been wrapped up as object oriented interfaces, um, and then you can query to see if the platform that you're running on supports that interface. And if it does, it will just give you an object backed that supports that interface, um, and you can then deal directly with the interface um, and then have a common way of working across all platforms. Whereas what you've actually got returned back is an object for that platform. Um, so you can call and work specifically with the object if you want to, um, but you don't normally have to, you know, you've got the interface so you can have a common code base across all platforms, which is fantastic. Okay, so it's been quite a, a Q&A to, to jump through. Um, just have a quick look for any last messages that I've missed. Um, I think I've got most of them. I say, if there's anything that I've missed, then please feel free to email me through you know, stephen.ball.embarkadero.com and um, we'll try to get you connected with somebody locally and, uh, and we'll get those questions uh, moved forward for you. Um, I hope you found this useful. I uh, say so it's barely scratched the surface. There's so much to kind of um, cover through. The product is so in depth now. Um, but uh, you know, it's really easy to kind of get up and going. And um, there's some great resources there to help you along the way. And um, definitely check out the samples. Um, there's some great sessions and tutorials through learndelphi.org. Um, so that's you know, definitely a place that I'd recommend having a look at. Um, but thank you again for joining me today. And um, we hope you, you, know, you have a great child experience and um, uh, yeah, happy coding everyone. Take care. Thanks, bye-bye.